Okay, hello everybody. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as I have a presentation. Um, so today I'll be running through Crypto Entrepreneurship 101 and it's gonna be, um, so please make sure that this, this is coming up okay on the screen for everybody. Are we all good? Can I get yeah, some confirmation? Yeah, it looks good. We, we can see it. Excellent, excellent, cool. All right, so I've got a, a pretty tight timeline so I'm gonna try to move quickly um, and I may end up having to jump over some slides in case I run out of time, but let's go ahead and run through things. So I'm Asib Qureshi. I'm a crypto VC. I used to be a professional poker player, as Kun mentioned, a software engineer and a startup founder. And I've been investing professionally in crypto for over five years. So I know what I'm talking about. I've been in this industry for quite a while, seen a lot of ups and downs. Uh, we're on a down lately. Uh, I, I'm sure those of you who are in this course uh, can't help but notice that crypto has been through a pretty crazy sentiment shift within the last year. Um, and we're going to be talking about that because I think that's part and parcel of what makes crypto entrepreneurship very different than other kinds of entrepreneurship. So high level overview of what I'm talking about today. First, I'm going to give you a sort of thousand foot view of startups and how I think about startups. And I think how, how you should be thinking about startups if you're thinking about coming into the space uh, from coming out of school. Second is I want to talk about what makes crypto startups different than other kinds of startups. Then we're going to go through very, very briefly the steps to starting a great startup uh, and then how to find a good idea and common mistakes in finding a good idea for the startup that you're going to build. Okay, so startups are special. Startups are special because they have magic powers. This is because startups are small, they're nimble, they're unconstrained. Uh, you know, large companies can't do what startups can do. They have a lot more moves available to them on the chessboard than a, a big company does. A big company is a lot more like a, you know, a lot more like a pond. It can only really move in one direction. It has, you know, some core product that it has to defend or it has margins that they have to take care of. Uh, they have a lot more regulatory constraints. Um, but startups are not like that. Because they're small, they're nimble, they're they're like a queen. They can take many different moves. They can take all sorts of risks. They're They're courageous. And most of all, Startups are innovative. This allows startups to do things that other companies cannot do. It allows them to take risks that other companies cannot take. Um, and that allows them to move into fields or move into industries that other bigger companies cannot move into. So startups can do amazing things, but most startups don't do amazing things. It's important to understand this if you're thinking about startups. Startups are stressful. each of you to understand if you are thinking about potentially starting a startup, okay? Uh, so this, this chart right here shows for each funding round, the failure to raise the following round of funding, okay? So if you raise a seed round, that means your likelihood of raising your series A is 20%, the inverse of this, you know, 79.4%. If you raise a series A, your chance to raise a series B is 50%. If you raise a series B, your chance to raise series C is 45% and so on. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller over time, which means that if you are if you raise your seed round, okay, which is not easy to do, you raise a seed round from a professional VC, your chance of making it to exit, an exit in this case means that you made it all the way through the journey and you got either an acquisition or an IPO, your chance of making it to an exit from a seed round is 3%. Your chance to making it from a series A is 11%. Your chance to make it from a series B is 16%. From series C is 20%. This means that even if you achieve what is pretty difficult within the contest of all startups to get funded by professional VCs, still your likelihood of making it through is very low. It's important to understand this. Most startups fail. This means most people should not start startups. Because if you start a startup, you will probably fail and you will almost certainly not become rich. Now, you can't help but notice that as you look around, you see all sorts of people telling you that starting a startup is the coolest thing you can possibly do. And that if you start a startup, you're gonna be so awesome, you're gonna start something great, you're so brilliant, you have all these wonderful ideas. Um, and you know, there's a whole cottage industry that has really spun up around this idea of selling the story about how great it is, how romantic, how impressive it is to be a startup founder. And you know, you guys are at Stanford. I'm sure that you breathe this air more than anybody else at pretty much any other school. You know, my understanding is that at Stanford, basically the two coolest things you can be, number one is being a college dropout, and then number two is being a startup founder. 
I think as a VC, it's incumbent on me to, to underline this, which is that startups won't make you cool. Uh, they won't make you rich. They will challenge you. They will stress you out. And they will take away years of your life. Uh, most people who build startups are not going to get that much out of them. And another important thing that I, I like to reiterate to people who are thinking about coming into startups is that there's a common view among people who are considering startups that startups, um, even if you fail, even if you don't succeed, that starting a startup is going to be good for you because it's going to teach you all these skills. It's going to make you, um, it's just going to make you a more worldly person or give you some set of experiences that are, that are, that are valuable. Um, and what I want to say is that uh, that's kind of bullshit. And the way, what I mean by that's kind of bullshit is that the most valuable thing that you get out of startups is having a chance at success. If you build a successful startup, you will learn a tremendous amount. You will learn so much about, about scaling, about managing people, about uh, revenue, about product, about customer management, about you know, customer support, all these different things that you will, you will, you will be forced to learn about. Um, it's incredible education. There's really nothing like it. Um, but building a startup that goes nowhere, building a startup that nobody wants, building a startup that mostly it's you shouting into the void and nobody listening doesn't teach you very much at all. It's mostly just a waste of your time and energy. And of course, a waste of other people's money. And um, although you may be able to start a startup and then get a job as a product manager somewhere if the, if the company fails, um, and maybe you'll get a couple of good relationships out of it. You know, to be honest, uh, starting startups that don't go anywhere doesn't teach you very much. It's not a very valuable way to spend your time or your energy. Um, so that's why I think it is very important. I, I, I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't start a startup. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to scare you because I think it's important to be scared of startups. Um, you should be scared of starting a startup. There's only one good reason to start a startup. And that is because you want to solve a big problem with your life. And you are willing to sacrifice time and energy for a chance at it, for a chance. It will probably not work out. And if you start a startup, you should understand that in your bones, that most likely this will not work out. But for a chance at getting something right, a chance at building something big, changing something with your life, with your career, with your time, that that is worth it to you. That is the reason why you should start a startup. Now, that being said, it can't have escaped you that uh, many people who start startups end up becoming incredibly wealthy, incredibly rich. Um, and so you, it, it begs the question, why are startups so valuable? If, if what I'm saying is true and most startups tend to fail, why is it that so many people, so many ideas, so much culture is pushing you for this idea of like, like hey, you should start a startup. Um, in fact, some of the most valuable companies in the world today are startups and, and the value of these startups have grown tremendously over the last 10 years. Uh, now, some of these valuations have obviously pulled back. If you've been paying attention to what's happened last year, this is a, these are stale numbers from April. But um, it's certainly still the case that these 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 startups or these you know private companies are tremendously valuable and they've grown incredibly quickly. The reason for this is that not all innovation comes from startups, but a lot of it does. A lot of companies that you are likely familiar with, you know, products like Google Maps, DoubleClick, which manages the the uh, the ad auctions for Google, Instagram, Android, PayPal, YouTube. These companies were all startups. These companies were all startups that were acquired by bigger companies. You know, in the case of uh, some of these, it was Google. In the case of some of these, it was Facebook. Um, these were all companies that were acquired at some point. And those acquisitions led to them becoming very, very successful products. So let's zoom out for a second and think more bigger picture. Why is it that startups are so important? And why is it that if you do build a successful startup, that you will get rewarded in such a big way for building a successful startup? The answer is because most economic growth comes from innovation. Innovation means finding new ways to do things better than the old ways that we did things, right? So basically taking innovation, fundamentally what it does is it allows you to take the same inputs, the same raw materials, and get better output for it. That's innovation. It's improvements in the underlying process of making stuff that we care about. Now, in a world of declining growth and in declining interest rates, innovation is extremely valuable. It's one of the only valuable things that we have left in a world where we're not making more people and um, you know, interest rates are going down. Now, you, you obviously have noticed interest rates have gone up over the last year, but actually real rates 
Uh, so real rates are the difference between the nominal interest rate, which is the number that you see, you know, at the Fed funds rate, which is oh, you know, it's almost five percent. Um, but of course, if inflation is five percent or higher than five percent, then actually real interest rates, which are what you get when you take the nominal interest rate, you subtract the the inflation rate. Um, that is actually negative right now. It's it's actually we're still uh, real rates are are still very negative, which is what they were uh, three years ago as well. So. Now, if you if you if you zoom out a bit, okay, ignore the the recent you know kind of uh, inflationary events that have been happening lately. If you if you zoom out and look over the last you know seven hundred years, interest rates have been going down for as long as we can possibly measure it. That's a very important fact to understand. Interest rates have been going down for as long as we can possibly measure it. And when when I'm talking about interest rates, I mean both nominal and real interest rates. Okay. Now, what is an interest rate? It's important to understand what, what, what do I mean when I say this? An interest rate is the opportunity cost of capital. Meaning that if I don't give this money to you, how much could I get for that money elsewhere? That's the interest rate. The interest rate is what is the value of compounding this money if I don't take any risk with it or if I take the minimal amount of risk with it? So um, as, a, as a startup founder, in order for you to build a startup that's worth funding, the growth rate of your startup must be better than the prevailing interest rate. I mean, that you must give me better risk-adjusted returns than what I could get doing something much, much safer, right? Putting money into, you know, loaning it to the U.S. government or loaning it to a very, very safe corporation, okay? So if that interest rate has been getting lower and lower and lower over time, another way of putting that is that we have run out of, of, of great ideas of what to do with money. So we have a lot of money, we have a lot of resources, we have a lot of capital, but we don't have a lot of good ideas. Good ideas give you return on investment. They give you return on capital. And if you're running out of good ideas, if you have more resources than you have ideas, then that means ideas are becoming more valuable. When the interest rate goes down, that tells you ideas are more valuable. That means we're hurting for innovation. We want more innovation and we can't find it. That is why over time, more and more capital has been chasing innovation because of the fact that interest rates have been trending downwards for the last several hundred years. And so if it's true that most of that innovation comes from startups, that means most of that innovation is coming from people like you. And of course, there's a lot of money chasing startups. And you can't help but have noticed that as well. Uh, now, you know these valuations have come down over the last year, as there's been a broad correction in equity markets, and especially in risk assets. But the trend line remains unabated. The trend line you can see over time is that there's been more and more money going into venture capital. And venture capital is kind of the seat of where innovation happens. It's the very, very earliest stages of innovation. So whether it's seed rounds that have gone from, you know, 10 years ago, seed rounds, you know, the, uh, uh, what is this? This is the median. The median seed round was 600,000. Now the median seed round is 2.5 million. And series A, the median series A 10 years ago was 6 million. Now it's 15 million. So what that tells you is that these rounds, these funding rounds are getting bigger and the valuations for these companies are getting bigger because people are more starved for growth. So that is why, from a very, very high level, if you are successful in building a startup, the rewards can be immense. Now, of course, you probably won't be successful. That's okay. You can still take this class. But um, it's important to understand why this stuff matters and why this stuff is being rewarded by the market in a way that um, it wasn't previously. Why is it that your parents or your grandparents weren't talking about startups all the time, but we are? And the answer at a very, very broad level is, I mean, there, there are a bunch of micro reasons, but the macro reason is that interest rates are down, growth is down, population growth has decreased. And that's a lot of the reason why startups have become more and more important over time and why we, or why you as young people should be spending more of your time thinking about innovation and startups. Okay. So that's a, that's a very, very high level uh, uh, understanding that I, I think it's useful to communicate. Um, and that concludes the pep talk about startups generally. Let's dive now into the meat of it and talk about crypto. How are crypto startups different from normal startups? Okay. And by the way, I'm going to be calling it crypto. I'm not going to be calling it Web3. Just FYI, you know, if you prefer the term Web3, just sub that in when I, when I say crypto. So first thing to understand, crypto startups are subversive. Okay. They have many enemies at many different uh, in many different jurisdictions around the world. Uh, there are many companies that have banned crypto. 
of course, uh, China being the the most significant among them, um, but you know mostly countries that are very heavy on capital controls. The SEC, you know, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, has made very clear he's not a big fan of crypto. Um, and although you know there's there's mixed reception of crypto in most governments and in most places, um, although there is mixed reception of crypto, let me turn my video back on. Let's see here. Okay, cool. Um, although there is mixed reception of crypto in many places around the world and among many regulators around the world, um, you know, crypto startups, it's one of the few industries that you're going to work with that you are going to have to wonder, um, is what I'm doing illegal? Are regulators going to come after me? Um, most startups, most things that you build, you will not have this problem. But in crypto, you will. You do have to think about uh, law and regulation and you know all the different jurisdictions in which you're going to be operating if you build a crypto startup. And of course, we're going to have some lectures later on in this course that are going to address that. Next thing about crypto, of course, that crypto is extremely volatile. Um, you know, it, obviously, everything has been volatile in the last year. So across 2022, you saw you know uh, a bunch of very very stalwart public companies like you know Meta and uh, you know the PayPal and uh, you know uh, Netflix and companies like that have very very steep drawdowns, as did the S and P and the Nasdaq itself. Uh, but crypto. Has been doing this for a while. Crypto has had very, very steep uh, uh, drawdowns as well as upswings over the last, you know, basically five, six years. So, uh, or since inception, but most notably, you can see it in the chart over the last five, six years. Um, so, this is just part and parcel of how crypto works. And so, when you see, okay, wow, crypto prices are quite low from where they were two years ago. Yes, that's been true almost every single year. Uh, there's always been a view that crypto is volatile and it's just part of it's part of the game, and I don't think that's something that's going to go away even over the next few years. And this volatility makes it difficult to tell what is real product market fit. Um, product market fit is a term that means, you know, is this product actually what the market wants? Meaning that, you know, is this thing ready to scale? Is this thing really uh, have we have we cracked the code of building a great product that's going to fly off the shelf, so to speak? Um, it's difficult to ascertain that when prices are super random and they're all over the place. Uh, but that is very much. Uh, the case in crypto and something that you have to be mindful of. The next thing about crypto that's that's quite different is that crypto uh, startups are open source and they're very public by that nature. Um, it, when you're building in crypto startups, you are on Twitter all the time. You have your, you very often you have a Telegram, you might be on WeChat, you might have your own open source uh, repo that anybody is, uh, um, anybody is playing around with and interacting with even before you're ready to go mainstream. So that means that in crypto startups, community is everything. And this has a lot of implications on strategy, which uh, I'm sure you guys are going to get to later on in the course. Now, if you want to build a startup in crypto, there are basically a few big steps that I think you have to you have to kind of get through in order in order to build a great startup in crypto. So the first thing is you want to make sure that you first learn. You need to learn the culture, the products, and the history of the sector. Um, you don't want to just say, "Hey, I love crypto, and I have this great idea that I." You know, thought up in a dream. So I'm going to go and build this thing. Okay, very strongly do not recommend doing that. Uh, crypto is a very complex field. It's one where a lot of intuitions are not going to serve you well in crypto because there are a bunch of things in crypto that are not intuitive. In which case, the most important thing to do is to really make sure that you take the time to learn what came before you, what works, what doesn't, and and why is it that crypto, uh, you know, sort of works or doesn't work the way that it does. Second. Um, is that it's very important to find great co-founders. Finding great co-founders is difficult. Uh, there are certain places that I think I would recommend to find co-founders and others where I would not. Um, then you want to come up with a great idea. So coming up with a great idea is hard. We're going to talk in, in more detail about how to find the great idea and how to validate it. And then, of course, the last step is to raise money for that idea from a VC like myself or like uh, a local I know you guys heard from earlier. So step one is to learn. Do you know enough to start a startup? The answer usually, if you're at the very, very beginning of your startup journey, the answer is usually no. You don't know enough to start a startup. Um, and you need to take some time to immerse yourself in the culture, immerse yourself in the products and the history of the industry that you're working in. Um, so I, you know, I would generally recommend that if you are not very situated in crypto, you don't know crypto very well, spend a lot of time playing around with products. You know, make a list for yourself of all the things that are in the sector that you're working in. If you're working in DeFi, if you're working in infrastructure, go try out every single product you can think of that matters in that space. Get to know 
the history of the products that are in that space, talk to people who are working on those products or who use those products and build an understanding of what they care about and why these things are built the way they're built. Now, the best way to do that is actually join another Web3 startup. So I consider this to be the best education you can get in startups. And it's what I did before I founded my own startup is go work for a startup. If you were at a startup, one, you're going to be surrounded by people who are very often going to be great potential co-founders. Two, you will absolutely be immersed in the culture of the products of the space. Three, you will have a much deeper understanding of what do people in this industry care about? How do they think? How do they talk? How do they walk? All those things are going to be instructive to giving you the mental model that you need in order to figure out what is worth building and what is a waste of time and energy. Uh, read voraciously. Go to meetups and hackathons, play around with the tech, you know, read newsletters, follow people on Twitter, you know, get yourself into the knowledge graph of what people are thinking about and talking about in that particular space. And if you aren't technical, get technical, at least a little bit, right? So even if you are, hey, I'm the BD guy or I'm the, you know, something else, uh, spend, if you know, look, if you don't know, um, if you don't know how to, how, well, let's say this, if you don't know Solidity, learn Solidity. Uh, if you don't know how to use a block explorer, learn how to use a block explorer, right? If you don't even know how to code, even the very, very basics of, you know, Python, just learn a little bit of Python. Any marginal improvement you can make in your own technicality is going to help you in being better equipped to be able to start a startup and think clearly about how to solve important engineering problems that are, that you're going to face as a startup founder. Okay. Once you do that, it's time to assemble a team. The best teams are composed of friends. Okay. A lot of people, when it comes to founding startups, they think about, oh, you know, I want to do some co-founder dating thing. They go to some co-founder group or some, you know, I want to found a company, um, you know, lunches or whatever. I, I don't think these are great ways to find uh, co-founders. Co-founders are very, very deep and intimate relationships. Um, they're, it's very hard to find somebody who's going to be a good co-founder to you. And the number one cause of co company failures is co-founder breakups. So it's important to recognize that this is actually a very big risk to your startup, is that you pick somebody who is the wrong partner for you, and it's going to result in wasted years of your life, wasted you know, energy, wasted money. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly common, and I can't caution against this enough, to be thoughtful about how you choose your co-founder. It's important to understand, even if you find somebody who you want to start something with, you don't have to jump directly into starting a company with them. I, I very strongly recommend if you have somebody with whom you want to start a startup, work on a small project, do some consulting together, especially if it's something that you can charge money for, because money is the number one thing that's going to bring out personality differences and or differences in working styles with somebody who you potentially want to found something with. So if you want to use somebody as a co-founder or pick somebody as a co-founder, you want to pick somebody who you trust with your life. Somebody who's competent, somebody who's resourceful, somebody who compliments you. Um, the, the, the famous, uh, uh, a turn of phrase is that you want to find somebody who reminds you of James Bond, somebody who you could drop into any situation anywhere, and you feel like they would manage to, to be okay and make their way out. Uh, that's the kind of person you want to look for when it comes to finding somebody to found a company with. Now, um, some people say, look, look, I want to be a solo founder. That's okay. There are some great solo founders in crypto who've been very successful, but generally speaking, most teams uh, have more than one founder. Usually the answer is two to four. Uh, more than four tends to be too unwieldy. And then, you know, there's disputes over who's actually pulling their weight. So generally speaking, four is the most that you want to have in terms of co-founders. Um, two is usually, uh, two or three is usually the the, the most standard number. Um, solo can work, but it's more difficult. And look, starting startups is hard. And I don't know that you'd want to do it alone uh, just because it's it's just more psychologically challenging to have nobody else there with you to help pull the weight, especially in the very beginning. Uh, but one thing that you do want to understand if you are not a solo founder, is who's the CEO? It's very important to decide this up front and not have this be a point of contention later on down the road. And usually it should be easy to figure out who's the CEO. One of the two people should jump out at you as being like, hey, this person should be the CEO. This Now it's important to also uh, respect that the CEO does not mean this is the more important person. The CEO is a particular job. This job is the job that is going to be responding to investors, is going to be signing the papers, is going to be doing the fundraising, is going to be the sort of figurehead uh, for the company. Now, different CEOs do different things. There are product CEOs, there are business development CEOs, there are sales CEOs. Um, so it really depends on what the CEO is going to be doing and what the particular company is. Um, but if you, if you don't know who the CEO is by the time you're raising money, that's a very big red flag. And it usually means there's a fight waiting to happen. And 
you know, your, your VCs are not going to be very interested in funding a fight. Also, it's important to also think about equity splits. So let's say that you have two founders. Um, that's not always 50-50. Sometimes it's 50-50, and 50-50 is usually the default if you don't have another consideration of how to split the equity. But if somebody is genuinely bringing more to the table, it's totally okay to have an equity split that's 60-40 or 70-30 or 80-20. Um, even if you have three people, sometimes one person has 15, the other two have 25. Um, so it depends. It depends on what they're bringing to the table. Oftentimes it depends on who is there first, who contributed more IP, who's more senior and more experienced, who has some important consideration that gives them more negotiating power at the table. The important thing is not that everybody is equal. Sometimes they are very often. That's the most common thing is that everyone's equal. But even if they're not equal, the important thing is that everybody is committed and in agreement that what happened is fair. That's what's important. So make sure you figure out your equity splits before you end up going trying to actually uh, raise money for, for a company. And three, come up with a great idea. Validate the idea is actually great. We're going to talk about this shortly. And then finally, raise money. And you'll be hearing about that in a later lecture. So now I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about FTX, because how does FTX change all of this when we're talking about startups and raising money? Right. So FTX, for those of you, I'm sure all of you are, are very familiar, especially given that you know, uh, Sam has an affiliation with, with Stanford through his parents. Uh, FTX was one of the largest corporate frauds in recent history. Um, one of the, one of the biggest perhaps in corporate history period, uh, Sam, uh, just, you know, the very, very brief story, Sam was a sort of luminary founder. He was, he was lauded the world round. Um, he was on billboards. He was on magazines, um, considered to be the youngest, uh, youngest billionaire. And, um, one of the, you know, basically the, the, the youngest, uh, or sorry, the, the, the richest, self-made billionaire under the age of 30. It turned out he was running a fairly massive Ponzi scheme where he was taking deposits at FTX, which was a crypto exchange that he ran, and um, uh, funneling those into his affiliated market maker, which was losing tons of money uh, and managed to make a bunch of illiquid investments as well as lose a bunch of capital, uh, which lost billions of dollars worth of customer assets. So the, uh, the, the aftermath of FTX has triggered a pretty massive regulatory backlash uh, around the world. And this, of course, affects the prospects for crypto startups in different ways for different sectors. Um, so, you know, for for if you're building a layer one protocol, uh, you're like building an underlying blockchain or you're building a DeFi protocol. I don't know that actually FTX, in retrospect, has that much of an effect on you. But if you want to build a crypto exchange or if you want to build, you know, something that custodies crypto assets on behalf of users, FTX certainly is going to have an impact on the way in which you have to build that startup and the way in which that startup can be treated by regulators. Ultimately, when something like FTX happens, it results in a decrease of trust across the board. And a decrease in trust is bad for startups. Now, that doesn't mean that this decrease in trust is going to be permanent. It's not. Almost always these things are temporary. And eventually there's a recovery. People forget, they move on. Um, if I had to guess, that would take probably, you know, call it three to six months until people mostly are past what happened with FTX. Regulators are going to hold on to it for much longer than, um, you know, sort of retail investors and institutional investors. I think institutional investors are going to move on and retail investors uh, more quickly. But this decrease in trust is a real thing. And startups need trust. They need trust because in order for somebody to play around with the startup, they have to be willing to take risk, right? Uh, why are they going to put money into your startup if they're worried about even something like Coinbase or Binance? If they're worried about those companies, why, why would they be willing to take a risk on, on you? So the startups need that trust. And that trust, it'll come back, but it takes time. And in the meantime, it is going to be more difficult for startups to operate and for them to acquire users and acquire capital um, over, the, over the short term. And yet, in the last month, you've seen that crypto prices have returned to trend. In the last month, uh, so today is, uh, what is this, uh, January 22nd, I think. Um, in the last 30 days, Bitcoin is up about 35%, actually more than that as of this morning, so maybe like 38%, um, a pretty significant increase. And in fact, if you look at what happened in crypto prices over the last year, they were pretty tied to the NASDAQ, pretty tied to interest rates. And that trend got bucked when FTX collapsed. You saw a big uh, drawdown in crypto assets, about 15% when FTX collapsed and, and it became known that FTX was a massive fraud. Um, but actually in the last 30 days, you've seen a total recovery in that crypto prices returned back to the trend that they departed from when FTX went down. And, and now, now why do I say that? The reason why I say that is that what that tells you is that investors basically are saying, look, FTX is bad, Sam is a bad man, all this stuff is, is terrible for startups and that's unfortunate, but our long-term view on crypto, which is ultimately what prices are expressing, they're expressing what people believe about the value of these assets in the future, 
our long-term view about crypto is basically unchanged. That we basically believe that crypto is still a valuable thing. And we still want to invest in it. We still want to hold it for the long term, despite the fact that you know FTX turned out to be a massive fraud. Because at the end of the day, FTX vindicates why crypto is important to begin with. What crypto is trying to do is to make it so that you do not have to rely on other individuals, on other companies, on other institutions in order for you to trust your money. That was the original reason why Satoshi Nakamoto invented Bitcoin. The, in the Bitcoin white paper, it says, I've invented a way for you to transact without the need for trusted third parties. That is what crypto is all about. And that's ultimately what FTX underlines is the reason why you should not trust an individual. You should not trust a company. And instead, you should trust the code. You should trust decentralized protocols. And so that is why um, I want to say that although FTX is certainly bad for the industry, it is one that we are going to recover from. And it's already in the process of recovering from. Um, but the long-term prognosis for digital assets and for crypto remains strong. And that is, is something that we're seeing ourselves as venture capitalists from talking to our own LPs, many of whom are big institutional investors, uh, but also just seeing what's going on in the markets and what's going on in terms of um, kind of prices and demand for investing into startups themselves. So I don't have a ton of time left, so I'm going to try to move through fairly quickly. Um, so let's talk about ideas. How do you find a good idea? The kernel of every startup is the idea. Uh, there's an old saying in Silicon Valley that ideas don't matter. Execution is everything. Uh, it's a little bit overstated, but kind of what it means is that, look, you shouldn't be secretive about ideas. Uh, now, what I mean you shouldn't be secretive is that you know, ideas are hard to do anything with, uh, meaning that if you tell a bunch of people about your idea, um, you shouldn't be worried that somebody's going to go steal it and do it better than you. Because it's very hard to steal an idea and do it better than somebody because ideas are a dime a dozen. Ideas are everywhere. There's so many ideas that are out there. Uh, the hard thing is building an idea well. Now, that doesn't mean that ideas don't matter. They do. Bad ideas will almost inevitably lead to failure. But good ideas can very often lead to failure too. So the important thing is to find a good idea and to test it from as many angles as you can to understand it very deeply and then to go and embrace it and go try to build it into something great. Okay. So um, how do you find a good idea? Well, there are two ways to find an idea generally. Uh, one is through top-down ideation. And the others is through bottom-up ideation. Okay, I'll describe each of them in turn. So top-down ideation. Top-down basically takes a bird's eye view. Imagine you're sort of behind a veil of ignorance. You don't know who you are. All you know is the industry. You know crypto. Ask yourself, what are the biggest problems in the industry? And sort of break it down by verticals, right? You might say, okay, what are the really big problems today? The really big problems are that blockchains aren't private. That's a really big, massive problem. Or it's hard to monitor transactions. That's a really big problem. Tax compliance, hard to pay your taxes in crypto. That's a big, juicy, unsolved, hairy problem, okay? Then you want to take those big problems and figure out what is the total addressable market, the TAM, for each problem. And what is a total addressable market? A total addressable market is a way of trying to measure if, I, if there were a startup or a company that solved this problem, what would be the potential pie that could be earned buy that startup, right? So you're basically measuring that in terms of revenue, how much annualized revenue could a startup build or in terms of market capitalization, how much market cap, if you sort of take that revenue and, and extend it by a multiple, um, how big, how, how valuable could a company be if it solved this problem and earned this much revenue every year? So that's a total addressable market calculation. Um, usually these are done kind of back in the napkin, like these are not very exact numbers that you're gonna be coming up with, uh, but it's an important thing to understand you know, on a relative basis, at least, looking at these different problems, which of these is the biggest problem? Because the biggest problem is going to be able to um, sort of, uh, it's going to be able to support the biggest company and have the biggest prize if you build a startup that addresses that problem. Now, when you're looking in top-down ideation, right, so you're looking at these big kind of, uh, uh, these big kind of loosely defined problems, and you're doing a TAM calculation for each of them, um, you want to ask, of course, how crowded is the area, right? So it's not enough to just say, hey, this is a big problem. It's like, okay, well, how many other people are trying to tackle this problem? Because if I'm one of 40 people, then I'm probably not going to be able to win but a very tiny, tiny sliver of that pie. Uh, but if, if this is not very crowded, if there aren't a lot of people working on this, then maybe I got a good shot at being one of the big guys who are going to solve this problem. The other thing you want to think about is, are there recent innovations or breakthroughs or technological improvements that change the market structure? Right? or that changed the way in which somebody can tackle this market. So maybe, yeah, there were a lot of people tackling this, but that was two years ago when we didn't have you know, zero-knowledge proofs or whatever. 
Uh, and now that we do have them, I can now create a totally different approach to solving this problem. And that's going to unlock this massive market that wasn't there before. Right. So th that's generally how you want to be thinking about top down ideation. Start from the from the top, uh, you sort of thousand foot view of the industry, look down and try to figure out, hey, what's a great startup I can build? The second approach is bottoms up. And bottoms up starts with you, not with the industry, but with you. What is the area that you know best? If you don't know any area well, then go spend time in the industry and go figure out, you know, what area do you have best? Or what are the skills that you have? What are the relationships that you have? What are the experiences that you have that are going to inform your ability to build a great startup, right? So you're sort of uh, looking from your perspective up. Okay, from where I am, where is my connective tissue? Sort of what's my breadth for search that I can find of the, you know, the sort of most valuable hotspots in the industry that I can address from my own skill set. So, so what feels like the biggest pain point from your perspective? Um, and what's a product, you know, oftentimes the way to do this is what's a product that you wish that you could use yourself? And if so, can you actually build it, right? Play to your advantages, find connections, relationships, distribution that you can tap into given your own experiences. So this is bottoms up ideation. And usually when you build a startup, it's, you want to do some combination of both. Right? You want to sort of take some top-down understanding of how the industry is structured, but you also want to look bottoms up at what are my skill sets, what am I good at? Um, the more experience you have, generally, the more you should tend toward bottoms up ideation because you have a more differentiated skill set, you have more advantages that you should be leaning into. Um, and the the sort of the earlier on in your career you are, the more you should be thinking top down because you're not tied to any skill sets, and a lot of your skill set you're going to gain through actually building stuff. You know, obviously, not always there are some products that are very technical and require a, a deeper set of experience before you can actually build them. But by and large, that's how you want to be thinking about top-down versus bottoms-up ideation when you're thinking about how to find a good idea. Okay, now what are the features of a good idea? I'm going to run through this pretty quickly because we're, we're running low on time. Um, so first, a big idea should solve a big and clearly articulable problem. Okay, And I, clearly articulable is a very important part of that. One of the most common mistakes that I see as a VC is a startup founder cannot explain the problem they're solving. It is not clear and simple and easy to understand. Uh, if it's not clear and simple and easy to understand, then that means that it's probably not a good idea. Um, second is that they should be defensible. They should possess a moat. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by defensible in a little bit. Um, but high level defensible means that if you actually build something valuable, that you are going to be able to capture value from what you build. And it's not just the case that anybody can come in and copycat you or build the exact same thing, meaning that, okay, I, I solved this big problem, but I don't get to enjoy any of the profits from actually solving the problem. Um, should be easy to explain both to uh, customers, to VCs, and to your own employees when you're trying to hire people into your company. Um, should have a very well-defined customer or user. Should have a very clear why now, meaning that why doesn't this product already exist? Why doesn't this startup already exist? Why, you know, why did it take until today and you for this thing to start working? Because, of course, before now, it, it didn't work, right? Nobody built this. Um, so you should be able to understand or explain to other people very clearly why did it take until right now for this company to get built. Uh, and lastly, you should have strong value capture or business model, meaning you should be able to uh, gain high margins. So let's talk very quickly about solving a problem. How do you know this solves a problem? First, you want to say, why will users use this product? And what problem does it solve and for whom? If you cannot articulate both parts of this, who's going to use it and what problem does it solve, you're in trouble. Okay. Second, you want to think about how bad is that problem? Is this a nice to have, or is this a must have, right? Is this like, well, you know, this, is this going to improve a little bit your ability to do taxes on crypto? Um, that's kind of nice, but there are a bunch of things that do that. Or is this like, this will be the end to end one product that solves everything that you would possibly have to do with crypto taxes. Okay. That makes it more like a must have than a nice to have. The other thing to understand is, does it result directly in cost savings? or an individual or a company, or some other kind of utility that's harder to quantify. If it's harder to quantify, generally speaking, that's a harder product to end up you know, being able to charge a lot of money for or to gain a strong margin on. Um, but if it directly results in cost savings that are easy to tell, easy to identify, then it's, it's generally a lot easier to get customers and to get people to be willing to pay for this. Um, now let's talk about defensibility. What makes something defensible or what gives you a moat? Generally speaking, Something that is defensible or something that has a moat is something that competitors cannot easily enter your market or overtake your market share. Usually this entails some kind of a network effect, right? Traditionally, we when we think of network effects, we think of something like Facebook, Ethereum, something like Binance, which is you know an exchange like Coinbase. Uh, these products are products that the more people enter on one side of the market uh, or on any side, right? The more people that enter, the more valuable it is for everybody involved. 
Facebook is a good example. The more of your friends on Facebook, the better it is to be on Facebook. Um, same thing with Ethereum, same thing for an exchange like Coinbase when it comes to liquidity. Um, but it's not the only form of defensibility. Other forms of defensibility are economies of scale, meaning the bigger you are, the cheaper it is to produce whatever you're producing. Uh, pricing power, you might have some special relationship with a producer. Um, you might have a first mover advantage. So you must, might be just be faster and be able to iterate and execute faster than other people. Um, cost of capital, you could have access to cheaper borrowing or cheaper capital than anybody else. Um, you could be access to talent. If you're from Stanford, you probably have better access to talent than other startups. Um, and the, the, the weakest form of defensibility is execution, basically meaning we will outwork you. We will work faster than you. That's the, the shittiest form of defensibility because it's not that defensible. But in principle, it can be a way in which you have an advantage over another startup and manage to maintain your edge in a market. So value capture, um, yeah, I'm just going to skip through this because I don't think we have uh, so much time to talk about it. Um, and then last, lastly, I want to talk about the idea maze. Okay. Before you commit to an idea, it is very important that you study the idea maze. Uh, another way of putting this is you need to study the history of what came before you, before you actually go down uh, building a particular startup. The, the, the concept of an idea maze comes from Balaji Srinivasan, who used to be, uh, of course, here at Stanford. Um, and uh, here's, here's the way that he uh, illustrates the idea maze. This is the idea maze for um, you know, music and P2P file sharing. I'll, I'll just read off uh, what he says with respect to the idea maze. He says, a good founder is capable of anticipating which turns lead to treasure and which lead to certain death. A bad founder runs to the entrance of the you know, movies, music, file sharing, P2P maze, or the photo sharing maze, without any sense of the history of the industry, the players in the maze, the casualties of the past, and the technologies that are likely to move walls and change assumptions. Okay, So what I mean by the idea maze is that you should study what came before you. What choices do they make? What mistakes do they make? What, what are the different moves available to them in the maze of whether it's DeFi or, you know, uh, uh, or under collateralized lending or, you know, uh, uh, staking startups or whatever it is, right? If you don't understand what came before you, what were the choices that were made by the previous people who traversed the maze, then you are almost certainly guaranteed to repeat their mistakes. And so that's why it is so important to spend the time to do the archaeology and figure out whatever it is that you're going to build in, what came before you, build a very deep understanding of it and be able to make decisions learning from their mistakes. Building startups is hard. And if you don't learn from who came before you, it is that much harder than what it has to be. So um, I just want to end on some very common mistakes that I see a lot of founders make when they're coming up with ideas. Um, the first thing is building for customers who don't exist yet. Okay, It's very tempting to say, well, you know, yeah, right now crypto is a bunch of you know, a bunch of DGENs and it's a bunch of NFT flippers and whatever, but I want to build for the mainstream. You know, I want to build for, you know, when my grandmother is going to be using crypto. Well, your grandmother's not using crypto today. Okay. So if you build a product for your grandmother, then basically you're building a product for someone who's not here. And somebody who's not here cannot give you feedback on your product. They're not going to use your product. You're not going to get any metrics on them. And startups need feedback. Feedback is the oxygen that startups breathe. If they don't have feedback, they can't learn. They can't iterate. And that is the lifeblood of startups is learning. Um, another common mistake is solving yesterday's problem rather than tomorrow's problems, right? So you might have looked and said, man, you know, it was so hard to, you know, when NFTs were super hot uh, to be able to manage uh, whitelists, right? So uh, I'm going to create a whitelist management product. Well, NFTs don't have that product problem today. The NFTs are much deeper problems than managing whitelists. So a very common thing that people will do is look back at what, problems they could identify previously, as opposed to looking forward to the next two, three, four years and say, well, what are going to be the big problems then when my startup is in its heyday? Um, another very common mistake, blockchain for X. If you build something that's like blockchain, blockchain for oil or blockchain for, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the, the advertising industry, um, probably a bad idea. Please don't do that. Um, building an unfriendly reg regulatory jurisdictions. Uh, sometimes this means the U S depending on what you're building, but you know, it's something to be mindful of. Uh, and lastly, building for crypto influencers. And this, I just want to say, it's, it's important to understand this. Although crypto influencers are a lot of who control the conversation, um, they're a very small portion of the overall people in crypto and the overall customer base. And they're very unlike other people in the customer base. Um, so th these numbers now are, I, I made this a long time ago, this is probably an order of magnitude off, but you know, there are thousands of crypto influencers out there, but they're very weird. They're not normal people. They're not the kind of people who are going to be using your products. And so if you build something because you think crypto influencers are going to like it, um, you're, you're going to end up missing the vast majority of what your users actually care about and what they actually want. Um, and so very, very common startup mistake is that somebody builds something that a crypto influencer says they want. Somebody says, I want to have a, you know, a, a homegrown 
uh, Bitcoin node that's built out of titanium that I can have on my desk at all times that has no parts that were built in China, right? That's what some crypto influencer says they want. Guess what? Nobody else in the world wants that, just like that guy and his two crazy cyberpunk friends. So uh, don't make that mistake. Think very clearly about who your customers are and who is going to want your product and build for a broader sense of what um, you know crypto customers and users are going to care about. So, okay, sorry. I ran through a lot of that content very quickly. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left and I know that you guys have some questions. So I will stop there and uh, feel free to ask whatever questions come to your mind. Awesome. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Hasi, for the detailed and awesome presentation. So just um, asking the people in the classroom, do you have any questions? Just raise your hand and pass the mic to you. All right, go for it. Uh, just pass it. Uh, hello, so thank you so much for the lecture today. And my question is that, like you mentioned that a uh, startup must solve a problem. And in your opinion, what is the main problem, if you like formulate it, that crypto in general solves for like people? It's a great question. What is the main question that crypto solves for people? Um, if you take crypto on a very broad basis, right? Like when you say crypto, you mean just cryptocurrencies generally like Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. Um, the, the big problem that I would say crypto solves is that crypto creates a new kind of money that is usable for different, that, that is much more open than money is traditionally. Okay. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a concept in economics known as permissionless innovation. This idea that if you want to innovate, that you do not need to ask anybody for permission and get their approval. Okay. Uh, most kinds of innovation in finance are very, very permissioned, right? If you want to build a new bank, you need to go get permission from the OCC, from your local fintech regulator, from you know the state um, state financial regulators. Like, there's tons and tons and tons of things that you need to do in order to decide I want to build a new bank. Okay, but if you want to build an app, you don't need to get anyone's permission. You just go build it. You just you know go into your garage, you cut up some stuff, you put it on the internet, and you see who comes. And you don't need to ask anyone, hey, is this good for the world? Is this a good idea? Does this cause financial instability? Blah, blah, blah. Nobody is going to ask you any of those questions. You just build it and see in the marketplace of ideas who wins. Okay. What crypto does is it opens up that concept to money. It allows money to become in the realm of permissionless innovation. So anybody, whether they be you know, a stalwart, like you know, a, a very experienced banker or a financial innovator or a company like PayPal or a company like Visa or you know, some uh, you know, Ukrainian teenager. All of them are on the same level playing field to build a financial application or find a financial use case um, and use money for it. Whether it's to build a decentralized bank, whether it's to you know, find some uh, application that, that deeply integrates money or that can send money to anywhere or anyone or even to a non-human being, which of course today there's no way to give money to something that's not a human being in the traditional banking system. But in crypto, you know, it, an AI can have money. A multi-sig can have money. A machine can have money. Um, these concepts are very new. Um, and that's what I would say is the quote-unquote problem that crypto solves, is that money today is too constrained, and crypto unbundles that money and allows it to be used in novel ways. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I can pass on the mic. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, so my question is uh, slightly more personal. So I was very curious um, about your career as a poker player. So what sort of motivated you to sort of shift out of poker and enter this field? And if you had to like say any learnings from poker that you would like us to learn, I mean, like overall life lessons from poker, what would that be? Okay. Um, so I'll give a very abridged version. So um, I was a professional poker player from when I was 16 years old until I turned 21. Um, I was you know, sponsored, made a lot of money at a young age, um, but I knew I didn't want to play poker for the rest of my life. Poker by its nature is a zero sum game, obviously. And uh, I, I never liked the idea that I was taking money from people who were doing real things with their lives and were actually adding value to society. Um, and I was just better at a card game. That always rubbed me the wrong way. And um, I wanted to do something in my life that was more intellectually engaging, but also was more valuable to the world than poker. Um, and so that's, that's in large part why I ended up moving on from the game of poker. Uh, it was something I struggled with for a very long time. But um, I was very happy in retrospect that I did. 
Now, what did I learn from poker? A tremendous amount. It's hard to, um, it, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to boil that down into just a few distillations. But probably the biggest thing that I'd say I learned from poker is to think about the world clearly in terms of risk and reward. Um, with a poker player, you learn that um, you don't always get rewarded for making the right play. It's a very, very deep insight in poker. Um, in general, in poker, it's often called being results-oriented. Um, you don't want to be results-oriented in crypto, or sorry, in, in poker. Um, results-oriented means that if one, you assume that you did something right, and if you lost, you assume you did something wrong. But uh, that's just not true. And it's not true if you live in a probabilistic world that if you make the if you if you make the right choice that you always get rewarded for it, right? The opposite is of course true that you may have done something with positive expected value, but in the moment you end up losing money because you know the coin flip didn't come your way, or even though the odds are in your favor, it didn't work out. Um, this understanding of risk is very very important to one being a good investor because of course it's very often the case that uh, you know it's, it's very obvious to see in poker. That sometimes you get your money in good, or let's say we go all in. I have, you know, aces, and you have, you know, uh, tens, right? Well, my hand is better than your hand, but I might sometimes lose. Twenty percent of the time, I'm going to lose, and so it might be one of those twenty percent of the times. In poker, it's very obvious that I see the right play, right? I still made the correct decision. Um, but in life, it's we very often try to convince ourselves that we don't live in a probabilistic world, and that you know, let's say that I uh, make an investment into a company, and I think, hey, I've got aces. I think this is a great play but the company fails. The company fails for a very dramatic reason. I might then you know, turn around and say, oh man, I made a mistake. I should have seen it coming. I should have known that this was the case. Well, if, if reality actually is probabilistic and it looks more like that poker game, then even if I make a great, a great decision, 20% of the time, it might not work out. And when it doesn't work out, it might not work out for a very random reason. And that reason might not be very instructive into how the original decision was made. And so that kind of thinking, it's not, it's not you know, mind-blowing but that kind of thinking doesn't come very naturally to most people i've learned and for me um, it's very deep and intrinsic to the way that i think about making decisions um, that allows me one to have a much higher risk appetite than most people and also to follow my um to follow my judgment about risk and reward much more easily than most people can and i think that that is something that served me very well in life and making different decisions that have led to me coming to where i am today Thank you. Hi. I wanted to thank you so much for coming today. Um, I wanted to ask a question about DAOs and if you think that there's any interesting opportunities there for innovation. Good question. Um, so I have been a pretty vocal critic of DAOs over the last year. Now, DAOs have fallen a lot out of vogue over the last year, so there's less to criticize these days. But of course, last year, you know, there was all this crazy DAO mania where, you know, if you remember, there was Constitution DAO and all these other, you know, Links DAO and all these crazy things where people were trying to buy random stuff through crowdfunded DAOs. Um, now that that has receded a lot, the behavior is normalized, and I think DAOs are in a little bit of a lull. Um, you know, for the most part, the way that I think about DAOs is that DAOs are DAOs are hard. DAOs are a very very steep trade off that are you, you need to you. you there's a, there's a big tax you pay in uh, using a DAO to to uh, do something, because DAOs are slow, they are um, not very smart, because of the fact that they have to kind of crowdsource their intelligence and they're relying on disparate actors who generally have less information than people who are very close to the product, um, but they get something for that tax that they pay, and that thing that they get is legitimacy, um, and of course the other aspects of decentralization such as censorship resistance and, and uh, you know, the the uh, the ability to be more resilient if one of the parties in the DAO is, is attacked or is, uh, you know, given a cease and desist or whatever. So there are kinds of things that make sense to build a DAO around, right? So for example, um, MakerDAO, uh, which is a decentralized stable coin and, and uh, you know, credit facility on chain, that is the kind of thing that it makes sense for it to be a DAO. It makes sense for it to pay the DAO tax. MakerDAO is stupider because of the fact that it's a DAO. In the same way that a democracy is stupider than something that is not a democracy, like California is a great example of this, right? California has this proposition system. It's a direct democracy, uh, which is you know, roughly analogous to how DAOs work. And uh, California does a lot of stupid stuff because of this proposition system, uh, because democracy is kind of dumb, because people who are making these votes are not thinking holistically about how to best shepherd 
um, a, an entire uh, apparatus the way that a, you know, a focused technocrat or enlightened you know, dictator might be able to. Um, and there's a reason why most things in the world don't structure as DAOs or as direct democracies, right? We don't structure the Linux Foundation as a direct democracy. We don't structure corporations that way. We don't structure families that way. Um, but we do structure states that way. And why do we structure states that way and we don't structure corporations that way? And I think that question, uh, I'm, I'm going to end my answer there because I think I actually, I, I like making it a little bit cryptic, but I think that question is a very important question for us all as an industry to think about is um, what are we getting out of structuring things as DAOs? And what is the cost that we're paying for that? And is what we're getting worth the cost that we're paying? So that was a very obtuse answer to your question, but um, given given that we're running up on time, I'm, I'm going to end my answer there. Uh, actually, um, thank you, uh, Hazib, for actually uh, go, going over like already like 12 minutes of your, of your time um, and for sharing with us the class, uh, your insights and uh, the lecture. Um, thank you so much for the lecture and for your time. Yeah. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.